start the show. For Thursday, June 20th, 2019, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Is right in the world. Where is my dubstep intro? Oh my well, god. Did I just clip blow, blowing just, things I'm, I'm out right doing just it? Like yeah. Will did last week. Oh well you got no dubstep intro, but we have the full squad back. Not since our episode five oh one spectacular have we had Jeremy, me, and our sweet quiche. Kari Watch twenty nineteen. I thought we has made, come to an end. I thought we made a deal that this show was over. <laughs> After 501, we all shook hands, we went all, our separate ways. We all gave each other that look. Like, that was a good run. You know, the people demanded more. Soft reboots, sequels are always a thing. You remember how this works? <laughs> I, I don't think I ever knew how this worked in the first place. <laughs> well, Kishore, thank you for coming back. We're, it's it's, it's a wonderful to have you back. Um, and we'll get caught up. First of all, how, how's everyone doing? How are you doing, Jeremy? You feeling better this week? I'm feeling better. I am. I'm feeling better. I am not 100%, but hopefully I won't have any moments where I, I completely lose consciousness this episode. What uh, <laughs> Jeremy's referring to, and I don't know if we'll post a timestamp of this, <laughs> but if you watch the video from last week's episode, which feels like over a week ago now, it's been a long, yeah. long week, but yeah. last week, Jeremy, Will, and I were here recording, and halfway through the episode, Will and I are talking about some nonsense. That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember <laughs> what it was. But if you if you look at Jeremy's face, he does the thing what Patton Oswalt did in that episode of King of Queens. You remember this famous scene where it's it's this, what a weird reference. Well, it's this thing that uh, Patton Oswalt was talking about before. But he was in the epi- he was in the TV show King of Queens. He plays like the younger brother of one of the main characters or something. But um, some scenes he's in the scene, but he has no dialogue. Mm-hmm. And so there's you get, a particular you gotta episode. Present. You got to stay present. You got to. You're still acting. Live studio audience. So there, I believe you could find this on YouTube. You got to search like Patton Oswalt, King of Queens or something. Uh, but if you just look at Patton, he th- I think he did this intentionally, see if they k- would keep it in. And they did. But the whole scene plays out. There's dialogue between all the other characters. And he's just standing there mm-hmm. and his eyes darting left and right between <laughs> the other actors. Yeah. And it's hilarious. And that's what basically you're doing. You're like standing still. And it looked like, as someone put online, uh, the drugs had kicked in at that moment. I have no recollection of this happening, but it did clearly happen. There's video evidence on it on YouTube. The only thing missing was the beat dropping. It would have been perfect. Yeah. I'm sure someone could figure that out. So, uh, but uh, feeling better? That's great. Yeah. Sure. Anyone want to know where I've been for the last month? I just assumed you were at home. Well, no. No. I haven't been at home. I have been undertaking one of the most important missions of 2019 i've been single-handedly trying to make endgame pass avatar by myself (laughs) i only have 40 million dollars to go i'm doing this heavy lift on my own 45 last i checked but you've been watching endgame on repeat non-stop making most of that uh, whatever movie pass you have and uh, making sure that disney gets its receipts i mean it the actual reason I haven't been here is mostly because of summer camp re- reasons and like end of school year kind of fun. But I'd like That's to much think. Boring, uh, much more uh, yeah, boring. I, yeah, I'm going to theaters every every time we, this podcast is being recorded. When does That's that come out on video? Never. Huh. I'm going to keep it alive in the theater. I'm just going to keep going and be like, well, people are still showing up to this thing. Yeah. It's well, cool. we're going to talk a little more about the box office as we get to our first section. Uh, but everything cool with everyone? Good. All the catch up done. Anything fun you guys did over the weekend? Oh um, no, man. No, it's all good. No, I got no, no I bucket got, list things dude, checked it off. It was Father's Day. Oh, that's right. right? So happy, post, happy Father's, Father's Day. Day to you. Thank you. Happy Father's Day to all of it's us. It's your first Father's Day. I think. Hmm. Yes, because I think <laughs> your for, child okay. is not one. So yes. No, 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 no. Well, well uh, the reason I hesitate is because for Mother's Wait, you Day, you have another child. No, I don't have another child. Thank okay. goodness. But for Mother's Day, some people count. When the child is still during the pregnancy as the first Mother's Day, because they're you know they 
impending yeah, motherhood. Yeah, but no one counts it the yeah. first Father's Day. No, no, that's why, that's why <laughs> I hesitated, because we had our first official Mother's Day this year, and yes, the official first Father's Day this year Congratulations. Well. What, what did your son get you? Um, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> what did you get, Jeremy? <laughs> I got a card. Oh, you I got a, a nice. I, my my daughter made me a pop up uh, card. It was nice. I got a full evacuation. <laughs> of you know, I, I got I, I got That's nice. Yeah, I might That's be back nice. in another month. <laughs> I got the best gift. I got comfortable insoles for my shoes because being a dad is hard. Yeah, that's good. And your man. feet hurt. Being at the a dad end of the is day. not hard compared to being. No, you know, a mom. no question. Being yeah. a mom I, I way really, harder. I feel like I use Father's Day as another another opportunity to appreciate uh, mothers and mother of my child. Here, here, Danica. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did go to the park and we just learned that there was a Boston Terrier meetup this coming weekend. So that's exciting. That's, that's what crazy. This, this weekend, your first child. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's move on. All right, let's head to our first section. story this week so friend of the site simone simone yet simone yet launched a video uh this week a couple days ago now uh that kind of blew our minds and it's it's our top story this week it is the truck law you guys watch this yes so it's a project that i think she's had in development for a while now and at some point we'd love to get her either on this show or on still entitled it wasn't to talk about it that long i mean like earlier we, this year yeah we saw her when she bought the car i think she's had it kind of just in her brain yes. for a long time she hinted at something when she first initially you know showed up with the with the model three and she, right. she posted images of that when she was um when she just taken um taken taking it and uh we knew something was in the works, but wow, did she go to fruition. It, it is beautiful. So if you haven't seen this yet, and it, it, it's on the YouTube trending right now, it is Simone and, uh, and also Laura Comp was in town. Um, and also, I don't, this must have been when they were here because they also both participated uh, in a Savage Builds episode. We'll talk about Savage Builds in a little bit. Uh, but uh, they also worked with um, a Tesla Modder. Oh, shoot. He's a cool guy, as far as I can tell. I really enjoyed his contribution to the video. Uh, it was, you know, the experience of, of taking apart Teslas yeah. and, and doing and doing modifications. He, he has a lot of experience with, with fixing Teslas, uh, with taking parts from ones that don't work. Rich them, Rebuilds is the name of his channel. And ones that, that don't, and then, you know, having a working Tesla again. And, and Marcos, too. Yeah. And, yep. and basically carved off the back end of a Model 3 and put a flatbed in there. A flatbed with an inverter for AC power that you can plug in. Well, that doesn't like the, everyone's talking about the inverter. Like that's amazing. It, that is a sweet touch. It's it's but totally it, sweet. It and is and the, the fact that you get full voltage. It's the truck bed that? that is awesome. Yes, <laughs> and it's it works perfectly with this car because the, it's flat. Yeah. in the back, and you know you can pull out the back seats, and it goes. It, the back seats are meant to fold forward and be basically flat. We've talked about how people with their other Teslas have know camped in them before right and this is basically taking that idea and they did it in a obviously a destructive way but not interfering with some of the electronics like rewiring electronics building these uh these uh these cable bundles as soon as they made a couple cuts the car went into emergency mode and like yeah. shut down yeah so they had to f- figure out how all those wires were supposed to be reconnected and they got it working again and you know the camera system works and and all the the, the functionality i don't know if they've done like autopilot in it before i don't know if she has that but Presumably, like it's still within the um, just the volume of a Tesla of, of yeah. the Model Three, so most of the stuff should so work. So it's not it a huge, great. it's not a huge like pickup bed. It's but it's there. It's only three and a half we- feet wide. At right. The she was saying that, wells, right? that she wished it was a little more so she could fit a full sheet of plywood in there. Right. Four by eight. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, Tesla has their own pickup truck coming out soon, and no one knows what that looks like. I don't and know how been, soon that is. Well, so coming eventually. Yeah. Right? There's that. There's a. There's debate in the the Tesla community about like w- what the one angle that they've shown in a in a concept drawing which side of the car that is it's the front it's the front it's supposed to be some futuristic tron looking car but for people who want that car now simone has done it she's made the truck yeah and i'm coming out here with a hot take (laughs) Uh oh i hate truckla truckla is trying to replace cheese louise cheese louise (laughs) is the pinnacle of electric vehicle you know uh, ridership I don't understand this. Like everyone's just so easily pushes Cheese Louise to the side. 
because there's a Tesla truckla thing on it? No. Team Jeez Louise. Uh, which one would get more attention on the road? Which one would actually survive on the freeway? Jeez Louise, I don't <laughs> think, could have had a lot of like juice to actually go Gee, see, range that's the wise thing. And, see like the truckla is gonna get you from point a to point b yeah. it could get you a sheet of plywood hey. cheese louise is an experience you're going to be telling your children about the time that you survived being in that car i'm telling you i, I don't think it's, it is. i don't think it's officially retired oh. i bet she's going to drive both and the, the awesome thing is no one else has this truckla right if it's it's in the Bay Area. If she's driving around the freeway, people are going to know that's that car. No, I bet you one in ten will know, and the other nine are going to think it's a new Tesla. Because it it's it's so well done. Yeah. I, I want to shout out like the part of the, vi uh, the build video, and if you haven't watched it, you should watch it. It's 30 minutes long. It's really excellent. Is when they cut the frame and the frame starts bending in. The mm. problem solving at that point um, uh, to sort of get it over the, the line and reinforce the structure uh, and there's, I think, a lot of great scenes with the the whole team kind of working together. As Adam said on Still Entitled this week, it, there was like a we moment there of all of them working together. And I really enjoyed kind of the problem solving of that. Me too. That was a good moment of tension when they cut that frame. What do you speculate Elon Musk's reaction is? Because as far as I know, he hasn't mentioned it publicly. Well, isn't he off Twitter now? No. Oh. What? He's, no. He's, no, he just said he was he's, on Twitter. He's tweeting memes yesterday. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, my assumption is that someone in his circle has mm -hmm. seen it and, and shared it with oh, him. He's definitely seen it because everyone, you think so? everyone was tweeting at him about it yesterday. Yes, 100%. He's, he's seen it. I think he, I mean, what does he think about other Tesla mods? Because other people have modded Teslas, There's, Tesla limos. You can't group this with those. This stands by itself. It, and it is also a creation of something he's also making. I think that's why he can't say anything about it. Yeah. Because he's, he's doing a pickup truck. They're doing a pickup truck. And so any type of praise or acknowledgement of this validates it in a way that you know, may affect, I don't know, yeah. spec more speculation, investor, curiosity, all that stuff. The stuff that he's gotten in trouble in the past for doing. I guess which hasn't stopped him before. But I wonder. I want to see her take it into uh, for service. <laughs> yeah, I think she might have voided her I warranty. Think warranties <laughs> yeah. So, take it in. See what they say. I, I, I want to go for a ride in it. Who doesn't? I want to go in the, in the bed. In the bed, yeah. yeah. I, it, also, the the team that put the commercial together, uh, who we uh, we know a lot of the, those people, just amazing. Yeah. Just amazing how they captured the essence of every pickup truck commercial I've ever seen. The lasso was, it killed me. Is it a lasso or a lasso? How is that, like, uh, how did that not translate? I don't understand that. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and people will point out, it's technically, it's not a pickup, it's a ute. Yes, this is true. Oh. All the Aussies are on people about. Explain the, that to me. Uh, that is an Australian phrase for a uh, like a utility vehicle that's like a coupe. Like we have crossovers yeah. here, which are this hybrid, you know, S SUVs and station wagons. Uh, in Australia, there are cars, and all over the world, there are cars uh, that are coupe-like but have like a bed, pickup bed behind it huh. um, that not necessarily as big and this totally falls into the category of a U. Do you think the official Tesla pickup will also be in that category? No, I think the official Tesla pickup will be a big car, big battery. Bigger. Yeah. Okay. It's so, just my speculation. One last question on this. Norm, when do we start on your car? When does the conversion start? No, uh, Jeremy I no and I need. are willing to come over. Yeah. Yeah. I have yeah. an angle grinder. Mm. I've got uh, wire strippers. And we have a tutorial of watching this video <laughs> online. Soldering wire iron. strippers. <laughs> like of all the th tools you could choose, uh, I think yeah. that one's probably not As long not as you can necessary. still fit, fit, uh, fit, fit the, the, the baby seat. Yeah. You know, then I can get the sign off. I think that's the most important part. Retain the baby seat capability. Yeah, and I don't think this one does. No, unfortunately, <laughs> no. There is no rear seat for for babies. But the dog is happy. <laughs> yeah, get fresh <laughs> air all day long. I guess this also fits into pop culture, but man, a lot of our friends are, are putting out some awesome things this past week. Adam's show premiered 
This is Savage Builds. So hope you, if you didn't get a chance to watch the first episode, it is on uh, Discovery for free. Go, right now for free in the U.S. You don't need to log in or anything. For, just for the next the couple episode. weeks, right? Yeah, yeah. The first episode is out. I think uh, if you want to watch the rerun, Science Channel is doing an encore presentation uh, this Wednesday after their presentation of BattleBots. Um, I want to call out something I don't think enough people are talking about with the show. Everyone's talking about the the suit, which is amazing mm -hmm. the titanium 3d printing and like their shots of it doing like real-time printing amazing it took me on this youtube uh, rabbit hole of of metal 3d printing that i i found just totally informative hmm. uh that whole area about laser fusion of metal powders into a solid shape so f absolutely fascinating it's the way all laser centering printing works right? SLS, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. In, in terms of you need to to do uh it, as opposed to having a bed, it's like a volume. And the volume, the powder kind of recedes from the volume from top down as opposed to from uh, bottom up. And you want to fill that volume with uh, as many plates. So a lot of it is in the arrangement of uh, your parts and your pieces to Particle kind of size jigsaw, uh, how they all can kind of Tetris together without touching. Um, hmm. But I also love how the material uh, uh, properties are different than pure titanium. Like there's a real just like a different sort of uh, mm. structural integrity and strength and all sorts of different component uh, like uh, changes because of the process having messed with you know home 3d printing in plastics and you know some plastics that have filament or uh, metal inside of the filament and things like that like i've i've seen prints that look good i have n i never thought like i honestly did not think there's any way even though it was had titanium in it even if it was mostly titanium in the filament, that it would retain a bulletproof property. That much, oh, and, and I it, thought the forty-five was going to shred it. Yeah, and, and not only th that type of uh, strength, but the rigidity that you can't you can't bend it. Like they had trouble even cutting just it. cutting yeah. it. Yeah, right. They, they tried to burn holes through it. Amazing. Like, the whole problem solving of how do you piece together these plates and hold, like they 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 showed a bunch of that, but. You know, if you had any idea like the number of people hours and the crew hours of of just sorting and arranging, yeah. and and that's something that they're showcasing with this show is just a lot of the team effort going in. You know, uh, Jen Schachter, who worked on Adam's team, just organizing and uh, and labeling. Uh, there are a few extra pieces, and we're lucky enough to to grab. I have I have a titanium piece. From, I think uh, you can give Jen PTSD if you show her like one of those like metal yeah. punches. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, and, and Sean helped, Kate helped. Uh, so a lot of uh, the extended tested family was also um, contributed here and there to, to that build. It's a totally awesome episode. There's a lot of great photos. Uh, just like Adam was so stoked to be in that. And, and it's in the cave now. Um, all right. This this weekend, we got Toy Story 4 coming out. I know we talked a little about that last, last week, but there's, there's more Marvel or Disney, Pixar, Marvel news. There so is. first of all, Toy Story 4. Retains the trend of Toy Story films. A uh, hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Last I checked, I think okay. it's Shorty's dropped. Dropped, oh, dropped to what? Ninety eight. Ninety nine. Ninety nine percent. Who's that one person? Oh, I still don't. I kind of don't want to see it. Why don't you want to see it? Because it's about a spork. It's yeah, Norm. It, defend Toy Story four. The spork idea, Forky. Mm -hmm. Tony Hale does a great job, one, of doing the voice acting for it. And I know that's the big novel, like, cons uh, idea, character for this film of what the ex existential crisis of a toy that is created from essentially garbage uh, as opposed to being bought as a toy. That is totally a, a, a important part of the story, but I would say that's still probably the B story in this movie. And it's less reliant, and a lot of the humor is derived from that storyline, but the feels all come from the characters you know and love. So I think I said last week, this film, no one thought it had to be made, but I'm still glad it was made, mm -hmm. and it is right up there with the other Toy Story so films. So you're saying this movie still had a lot of soul to it. That's oh. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. good. Before we get that segue, I will acknowledge, Damn. I know, very nicely done, Kishore, but last week we speculated whether uh, this movie would have a Pixar short, and it's now been, since been confirmed. But we didn't speculate. We assumed. We assumed. Yeah, we assumed. Oh, of course it's going to have a Pixar yeah. short. Can't wait. Is it going to be like a night and day? Is it going to be <laughs> right. like a Jerry's game? Yeah. What's, what's your favorite it's, Pixar? It's not going to be. Day. We know night and day. It's not going to be that Olaf one that was like 21 minutes, right? It's, it was going to be something reasonable, like that, Piper. That wasn't. In yeah, it front was. of a Pixar movie. Uh, it, it wasn't. Oh, was it? 
Was that it, was, of, it was either Disney or Pixar, obviously. But yeah, I, I, it was definitely a short. In I got think of a about. Movie. Wasn't that in front of Good Dinosaur, the Olaf thing? No, no, that was more no. recent than that. And Coco, possibly. Yeah, maybe it was Coco. Yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Let's say that. Wow, I, I know we talked about it on the podcast. But okay, it's it the, actually wasn't because it got so much bad press that they took it out. So by the time I ended up seeing whatever movie it was, it wasn't there anymore. Oh, and I remember they had movie posters for the short. They did, yeah, in uh, in, in theaters. <laughs> like, you gotta watch, you gotta watch this upcoming story, this twenty one minute story for uh, for Olaf. Uh, well, it turns out, long story short, there is no Pixar short in Crazy. Front of Toy Story four. It was in front of Coco. Yeah. Wow. What's no. your favorite Pixar short, Kishore? What do you think it is? It's Sanjay Super Team. Yeah, I knew that. Yeah. And you're yeah. you're Bao. I'm Bao. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And you're uh, Night and Day. Yeah, Night and Day for yeah. sure. For the birds is a close second. For I think me. it's day and night. Day and night, yeah. The one in front of up. It's so good, it but is. only in 3D. Like you can't even see it in 3D anymore. That's it's true. It's not on the Toy Story 3 Blu-ray. In VR. It is our great. chance. Oh, Release please. it in VR. Please. Right. 3D is built in. I have. I've gone deep on this one. I've tried to contact the director, and I've had not. Because you want that, that no experience. Luck. Yeah. You want to put it in big screen. Yeah. Have your giant virtual cinema, and and, and relive. Watching night and day, or day and night, whatever it was. Yep, it's so good. Uh, yeah, it, it is fantastic. So no short in front of Toy Story 4, <laughs> but we do have news. Uh, is uh, Upward? What's what's the name of their uh, their next their next film? The uh, Onward. Oh. On, oh. Onward. Sorry. Onward. You know I, that's confusing to me because Onward in my brain is the VR game. Yeah, it's very different from Onward. The no, VR yeah, game. yeah. So Onward is their next one, but after that, coming out, I believe, what is it, 2020, is Soul. And you said it's directed by Pete Doctor? It is his first film since Inside Out. So is it a <laughs> sequel ish? I don't think it's a sequel. It's a case. They said after Toy Story 4, they're putting a halt on sequels. But thematically, it could share some of the themes as Inside Out. Uh, what they said, what Pixar said is that, um, yeah, I guess it's a, that's next year. Holy smokes. Yeah, it's a year from now. June 19th. Onward later this year? Uh, Pete Doctor's previous films were Monsters Incorporated. Uh, no, onwards next year, March of next year. Uh, that whoa. means two no, Pixar they films. They won't do them that year. close together. They, they are. They are. Onward is March 6, 2020, and apparently June 19th, 2020. That's weird. A mere three months apart is Soul. That is weird. Wow. Okay, so Pixar will take you on a journey from the streets of New York City to the cosmic realms to discover answers to life's most important questions, Disney and Pixar's soul arrives in theaters June 19th. Is this a crossover with Eternals? <laughs> <laughs> I, answering life's most relevant questions, most meaningful, deepest questions, I'll pay 15 bucks for that, no problem. Mm. That's great. Hmm. That's a good deal. Yeah. I this bet, logo tells me nothing. I tell you, I bet this is going to be 100% out of the gate, too, like Toy Story 4. And and like Inside Out, yeah, it, it, it's groundbreaking I, ideas. This is opening itself up for some awful headlines accompanying the reviews. Why? Pixar's soulful. Oh yeah, ta- yeah. Mm. There's gonna be the so pun, many puns. The puns will be bad. So many puns. Soul good. <laughs> it's all. It's all good. Uh, I hope it's different than Onward. Not that I don't like. I I, I have not. I've only seen the trailer for Onward, but Onward seems to be a, like a story that's. Uh, more fairy tale like, yeah, right. With uh, and and uh, familiar relationships and these. It's like you know. it's like fairy tale creatures living in the real world, though, right? Yes, yes. But yeah. there's a lot of, like real world stuff and yeah. Uh, and uh, I hope this is more on the inside uh, out, more otherworldly, otherworldly. Yeah, yeah I, I agree because that's Pixar's always done that so well. I mean, obviously they started with Toy Story, which was actually they tried to make realistic looking toys that existed in the world, but they went right on to worlds that we'd never seen before and it's not like i think one is better than the other i just want to see if they're going to put out two movies three months apart yeah ha- have like take big risks with both of them and have them be very different so it doesn't feel like we're just getting pixar and pixar and pixar i don't know which, if, yeah, if if i had thought. if i'm placing bets on the pixar directors this is the guy who i feel is most consistent monsters inc up and inside out are a trajectory that goes upwards and they're well, uh, I, all good I think we should start a fantasy movie league with directors of Pixar films. Uh oh. Let's see what I mean, happens. there's a lot of new contenders going on. Who's the Wally director, Angus? A- Andrew Stanton. Andrew Stanton. Oh, Andrew Stanton. Yeah. 
Give me them all day. You like him? You like the yeah. Finding Finding Nemo, Nemo. Finding Dory? Mm-hmm. That's that's pretty good track record too. Brad Bird, pretty good track record. Yep. Incredibles, Incredibles two. Yep. Also uh, Ratatouille. Oh, Ratatouille, pretty good. And then you have the new directors, uh, Cooley, I think. Who did it, Toy Story four? Uh, Lee Unkrich or Toy Story four is Cooley. Um, shoot, I forget his name. Unkrich did three. Yeah, and also Coco. So there you go. He, Although he, he's he's retired. Retired. Yeah. Uh, Toy Story four is Josh Cooley. I want to say this is just pulling out my brain. First time. And it is Josh Cooley. Yeah. Oh, you know why I, Josh Cooley was familiar to me? Why he did those books? I want to say. Um, and I'm gonna, I will do some, the best thing you can do for a podcast, which mm-hmm. is to, to Google. Search uh, he did those books, Movies Are Fun. Um, oh, no, no, no. That's not what I'm thinking about. <laughs> I'm, this is also from, from Google. It's okay. We can edit this podcast. We're going to edit it. We're not going to edit this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Never mind. Never mind. I'm thinking of someone else. All right. Uh, other Marvel stuff. Kishore, Avengers Endgame. Yep, I'm, so I'm far, working on it. So far, has not beat Avatar in terms of the box office. So it's far, forty five million short. Marvel's going to do one last push for Endgame, and they're they're pulling out all stops. We're getting uh, extended cut. Is that what it is? No, no, extra footage. Supposedly, but Kinda. I believe it's something smaller than that. Wait, My- you you have a hunch of what it is? Well, well, I already read the article, so yeah. <laughs> Kevin Feige said hurt. that it is. They've he's confirmed that Mar- uh, Endgame before it leaves theater will have yet another revision because Endgame already had two versions, right? There was the the version that we all saw on opening day, and then they added the Spider-Man Homecoming trailer at the end of it hmm. as an updated version, and then now apparently after the credits, it will be post-credit content, but not a post-credit scene in the traditional sense. And what it sounds like is they're taking some of the behind the scenes or deleted scenes footage that would have been on uh, Blu-ray, would have been on the digital release. Probably will and be. Putting, and will, probably still will be. And putting that in theaters so people will go back to theaters um, to the <coughs> tune of hopefully 45 million plus. Mm-hmm. Is that why they're doing it? I think so. You think so? I think they really want that. And I will see you all there. <laughs> as many times as it takes. Average ticket price is about 10 bucks now. All right, so you still need about four to five million people globally. Got it. So rewatch Endgame. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> On it. Mathematically, it's working against you, Kishore. <coughs> Is it? <coughs> I, I think really? so. I, hmm. I think if you look at the trajectory, it's, it's right. real tough. Real I can do close. this all day. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and you will. Uh, speaking of Marvel, you know, the next Marvel movie, uh, well, there are a bunch coming out, but Black Widow's in the works, and Kevin Feige also talked a little bit about Black Widow. They haven't really confirmed whether it's going to be a sequel or a prequel, but it's more be prequel. indications are showing that it's Origin. it's going to be a prequel story. The kind of prequel story he alluded to Better Call Saul as an example of a prequel that really revealed a lot about the characters, even though it didn't need to push plot forward. So and someone else will presumably play uh, Black Widow? No, 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 no. Who is going to Oh, I'm no, sorry. That's Angelina Jolie. Scarlett, Scarlett Johansson. Johansson. Sorry. I mean, just like in Better Call Saul, <laughs> you know, same actor played Saul, except obviously older yeah, actor. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, and Marvel will be back because DC will not be present at Comic-Con, San Diego Comic-Con this year. Marvel will have a big Hall H presentation. Hmm. What could that mean? That, big that means you're going to be there, right? Sure. I'm going to go. Probably. Let's do it. Yeah, let's, let's do, do it. it. Let's go. Road trip. Road trip to Comic-Con. What has this been in the past? Well, it's been where they've shown footage, first-time footage, oh. for a lot of the upcoming films, where they gather the they cast. Introduced new actors, like Brie Larson was introduced as Captain Marvel. Josh mm-hmm. Brolin was introduced as Santa. It's Thanos where the first there. Avengers team assembled before 2012. Uh, How deep do you think they'll go? I think they need We're to... Going Kung Fu? That deep? I, I think they're going to have Eternals and Shang-Chi be pretty present there and i think those are the ones that they need that's the reason to do it at comic-con as opposed to a place like d23 D23. because they need to get the comic fan buy-in and and really ride that wave are you checking i'm just uh, checking to see if his eyes are doing that (laughs) thing because we're doing the comic splitting (laughs) if jeremy's tuning out playing with my cursor uh so dc like i said will not be there in fact dc's booth is going to be 
consolidated with Warner Brothers booth. So we even, won't even have that big comics booth. Of course, a lot of like in, in the comics world, a lot of turmoil because Vertigo looks like is going away. And we, we haven't talked about this in the podcast. It's a super sad note. I mean, comics publishing is a real tough business. I haven't read a Ver- in. Vertigo imprint in a while. I but I mean, it's just the, oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Of the legacy of Vertigo. Um, and it's, it's where Sandman was born out of. It's where so many Swamp Things. It was, it was one of the great indie lines mm-hmm. that like kind of you well, know, landed kind in of the mainstream. Became mainstream. Yeah. And, and they have merged those characters into the main DC Comics line. So it, it sucks that it, it's not going to allow like different risks to be taken. But again, the comics world today is very different than it was 10 or you know 20 years ago. Uh, DC, did, we didn't talk about this on the podcast last week either. We, be, in lieu of getting any type of DC panel, because we of course have the run, Robert Pattinson casting as Bruce Wayne for the Matt Reeves Batman movie but next year is when Wonder Woman 1984 comes out oh yeah and we, we saw the poster did for get it the first poster is it a poster slash costume image I don't know it was too bright for me to look at it was something the poster yeah did you see it no it was a google this right now yes sir it, <laughs> it is an amazing costume design. It evokes, it has the the, uh, the eagle chest plate that is almost like people have uh, said it's akin to the Kingdom Come. Wow. Chest plate. That's like um, that that Hulk Thor movie, right? Ragnarok. Ragnarok. Yeah. Has the colors, definitely has some of that really vibrant 80s vibe to it. I, I'm hoping somebody in this movie has a color changing shirt. I feel like that's the... Uh callback that I'm looking for. Well, Danica has said that in the very first promo image that was shown of Wonder Woman, 1984, she, her tiara looked more like a, a headband, like an 80s style Oh, headband. nice. Linda Carter throwback. Yeah. What are you talking about color changing? Did Linda Carter have, have a color changing shirt? No, I just feel like that's like a late 80s, 80s thing. thing. Oh, like Freezy Freakers? Yeah. 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 So what is this um, <clears throat> Eternals thing you keep referring to? Yeah. No. Kishore, sure, you want to do an I did a poor job explaining no, it last no, time. No, no. We can explain it, but no. No. Do it. No, Dude. we're not talking about the Eternals. Okay, never mind. Like, Thanos, no, we'll, we'll wait for it. Thanos is an Eternal. There's like genetics to explain. Like, there's too much stuff. Like, oh, no. it's cosmic. It's I've genetic. Lost interest, like, yeah, it's You've real lost. bad. Wait for the movie to come out. Watch the the YouTube explainer. Uh, after Comic Con will be D twenty three. That's the end of August, and the expectation is that in addition to a lot of the Disney films and the Marvel films that will be shown there, uh, they're going to talk about Marvel's involvement in Disneyland because end of this summer, you know, Star Wars Land will have launched, and obviously, in the Marvel or Disney is looking forward to what else can they do to their theme parks. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like. In Disneyland, they're going to build some type of MCU area. Well, that's this is actually old news. <clears throat> they actually started construction in October. Mm. They shut down the Bugs Life in September, and they began t- totally renovating that. And they had the Starks uh, industry signs up oh, for construction surrounding that then. Yeah. But what th- just happened was they just got permits. <laughs> uh, Anaheim had to give them permits for... Maybe like a bar? food, exactly. Inside. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there'll be another place where you can buy alcohol. I guess it's going to be themed after Ant Man. It's a, I'd say, microbrewery. Do you get it? And uh, I don't know. There's a lot of shopping. Gosh, if it was themed after Ant Man, they could have just kept the Bugs Life stuff there. <laughs> That's funny. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> so not a full ride. Uh, well, what do you mean? Like, like it won't be as big as, as like Cars Land, Cars Land or Well, they already uh, have Galaxy's the Tower Edge. of Terror remake. So that's, that's what their right. anchor is for this whole side of the park. And this is just phase one. Apparently, phase oh. two is actually going to involve... Using the parlance. Phase, yeah, right. Phase two is going to involve like a serious roller coaster that's indoors. Hmm. And so it, this is California Adventure then? Yes. But they're doing hmm. the same thing, I think, in Beijing. Disney. Oh, and okay. Also, I would imagine Disney, Disney World. World. Yeah. yeah Walt Disney there World. is a new coaster under construction at Epcot, and I think it's a Guardians of the Galaxy because it's the only IP they can use oh, in Florida. Right. That's right. Because east of the Mississippi, it's still oh, so all uh, Universal has the rights for the Marvel characters. And they're going to hold on to those as long as they can. Spider-Man ride. Do it, Universal. Yeah. Own those rights. There's nothing like going to Universal Orlando and seeing, like, above a cafe, a, bi- a giant silver surfer. I'm like, they're a little out of date. <laughs> it does feel a little 90s, doesn't it? But I don't think kids care. Spider-Man, yeah. rides, Spider-Man ride's still great at Universal. Do you guys plan to go to Galaxy's Edge this year? No. 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 Yeah, me either. I mean, if I got an invite and, and, and could go, I would jump at the opportunity. Have you guys watched any of the videos? Yeah. People building lightsabers? 
that's a whole like I expected there to be a a la carte place you go and you spend however long you want building your lightsaber. No, it's a it's a twenty minute production boutique like 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 a, like a special experience. That's yeah. why it's cost two hundred dollars. Exactly. Yeah, so you're surrounding, you get into a bar like area with someone in the center who talks to you about the force and you choose your Ky- yeah, kyber, crystal. kyber crystal, what yeah. color do you want? Yeah. And then you basically pick all your parts and then... It's but, about the experience. But it's about like keeping it to a certain amount of time so they can roll the next group in there which, too. Which is how they do the Harry Potter wand thing. But that one's more of a performance. Yeah, that's more of a performance. This is a little bit huh. more... Because like, you don't... Everyone's involved. You know, you go to the, the store, the wand store, and you're just taking this, the uh, wand off the shelf nicely packaged but you're watching the short performance it chooses a lucky child in the room and lucky parents have to buy the wand <laughs> or sad kids you know rest of the day is that true yeah, oh, yeah. Not, we talked about this right like it's a that. small group of like five to seven people and then the the whole you know magic happens in the room and uh-huh. then the the performer the lead wizard picks a, a lucky child and the wand <laughs> has chosen you now my assistant will escort you to the, the checkout counter <laughs> where the parents want yeah sorry you don't get it for free the parents want to spend you know 50 100 bucks or whatever it is wow. so to buy that wand they, they, they choose the children of the parents who look like the biggest sucker yeah, who probably. can't say no? Who can't say no? No, our arms aren't folded, All right? Uh, but everybody can buy one, though, right? Anyone can buy one, but yeah. you want to have the story, the experience. Oh, like, I see. What's 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 better? Like if you're seven years old, if you're five years old, and you're at Universal Studios, you know, Hollywood or Florida, and you you went to the store, and yeah, it looks like the, the, the amazing wand store, and your parents just put one off the shelf, and you go to check it, yeah, you're gonna be happy with that. But to go back to school with the story of being in this magical room and things happening, I think, and then a wand choosing you. Yes. Yeah. You're, but the way you tell it, it's like you have a good story. You go back, you can retell it. But I think for children, even like 10 and under. Just having the wand. Like, no, that'll change your life. Yeah, that's exactly. Like, you'll that's think. That's what I'm saying. I was chosen. You, you, you <laughs> that, that is, that is why it costs $100 to get yeah. into the th- these theme parks. Right. You're buying experiences. You're paying for memories. And when we, right as, as soon as these memories are being formed, there's a crucial periods in the developmental uh, time. Okay, so uh, yeah, Star Wars Land or Galaxy's Edge, there's a whole lightsaber thing. There's a whole, um, what is it? Uh, the uh, There's a real world the, the um, data storage things. What are those things called? Uh, the, I don't know. Um, I was thinking of the character. There's a there's a blue haired woman who is a character, and she's a new Star Wars character, and she's wandering around the park. Oh, and she she inv- she talks to you, and you can help her avoid the Imperials, and uh, help her you know do certain things within that that area of the park, I, which is neat because I haven't seen them do that anywhere else in the park. Mm. Um, the thing I read actually is it ha- doesn't have to do with uh, the data storage things, but it is the Kyber crystals. Apparently, there's a whole mythology about the Kyber crystals that you get at the Star Wars land, and people are unraveling more secrets. Secrets? Yeah. Secrets. I know there's black ones, and if you like, people have already discovered if you hold the the containers up to a light, like to your cell phone flashlight, you can see if you, there's a black one inside, and they're rare. Mm. The holocrons are what I'm thinking about. I, I think they're they're tied. There's a whole basically there's more you get out of the lightsaber than just yeah. Buying the lightsaber, right? But, uh, again, that's why uh, they're they're very expensive. Uh, do you guys see this video with the uh, Boss Town dynamics? I did. I mean, it, like it. I think it made the rounds because everyone thought it was real, or some people thought it was real at first. Well, yeah. So let's give him props for doing a video. People. Thought oh, it was the CGI real. in it is excellent. Yeah. Of the robots fighting back in in the context of a Boston Dynamics video. Right. It, it looks really good. You see them torturing the robot for a while, and then it finally flips out at the end. But so this d- is from Quarter, and they do a lot of like short films mm-hmm. and special effects films, and this is really, really well produced. It's it's a, like a three-minute video that goes through your standard series of tests of like, the kind of harassing of the robots you see from Boston Dynamics videos to show stability. Starting with a hockey stick, which is what Boston Dynamics themselves have done. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and then... They, they did things like, you know, for, put markers on the walls and things to make it look like the, the robot was tracking and then doing all these, like, uh, dexterity tests. Yeah. You know, uh, keep playing keep away with it. And then the robot starts, it, it turns. It turns at the very last minute, which I think was a smart move on there. No, at first it grabs the hockey stick. Like, uh, uh, from st- like, they're hitting them with it, and then it grabs it in a way that only a robot could, like, immediately and very quickly. And then they kind of put their hands up, and then they resume the torturing of the robot, like in the next scene. But then eventually the robot fights back and grabs the gun. <laughs> and it all goes wrong. And it all goes wrong, yeah. yeah. The grabbing of the hockey stick, 
it yeah, ha- happens halfway through the video, and that's the one I saw, and I saw it first on, on Twitter. Like uh-huh. Someone made an animated GIF of it. Oh, yeah. And I think that was the better way of sharing this, because if you watch the YouTube video at full 1080p, it looks super CG. Like it, it, It's great, great animation, yeah. but it, it looks clearly like CG. The lower res compressed GIF of it yeah, was high much set. more convincing. Yeah, you're probably right. Still, the CG is... It's great. I mean, like, surprisingly yeah. good. And then they kind of reveal how they do it at the end. Yeah. Which yeah. is worth watching. Yeah. Uh, totally worth watching. Um, moving on. Oh. A Reddit thread. Yeah, that explain this up. to me. Okay. This blew my mind. This was, it wasn't even in is the day stream. I want to believe it's real. This is from the, from the Star Trek subreddit. And a user posted there realizing, theorizing that if you look at. Wesley Crusher's famous sweater. This is a sweater gray sweater. It's a gray sweater with the three stripes on top. Red, yellow, and what? Green? Blue. Blue? Okay. That it's kind of a green blue. It's, it's an aquamarine. Okay. That those three stripes are supposed to represent the three potential tracks that an ensign can take or a cadet can take going in the Starfleet. Command Engineering Medical Science. Why does he think this? Because the colors I, match? I disagree. It's an ugly 90s sweater. You think it's an 80s sweater? 80s. Oh, oh late 80s, late right? 80s yeah. sweater. Oh, you're saying it's the three colors of the uniforms, uniforms that people wear in Starfleet. Yes. I see. As like, this is the potential. You wear this as your unlimited, your unbound potential. Right. And as you go through your cadet training, your, you know, to be an ensign. What are the colors correlate to? What are they? Well, the... Th- Red, red. Is, red is command. Okay. And uh, yellow in, in next gen is security and engineering. Uh-huh. And blue is medical and science. Okay. So who wears red in next gen? Riker. Picard. Or Picard. Riker. That's it? Uh, <sighs> no, there's the. Um, you know, on lower yeah, decks. Wesley, ensign, uh, Wesley as an ensign does wear red. Okay. On lower decks, there's some ensigns that. So, wear like, too. flight, you wear, I think you wear yeah, red. Ops, yeah, ops yeah, yeah. you wear red. Like, um, did Worf not wear red? No, nope. Worf wore uh, yeah. yellow. Okay, sorry. Uh, Worf, <laughs> How dare you? Jordy, Data, and Worf wore yellow. And Beverly and Diana wore, um, Diana wore, wore blue. And Data? Data wore yellow. All right, there you go. As engineering. I guess he's technically, what is he? What department is he in? Android ops. <laughs> <laughs> is it engineering? I guess it makes sense. It, it, you know, obviously the colors were swapped yeah. from That's TOS. Cool. That's cool. But I'll, I'll I'll go along it. with that. But yeah. no one else was wearing that. I would assume. Like, no, did they, did you see any other cadets? No, he was special. He was like he was acting ensign, right? But like he went. There was an episode with him in school, and no one was wearing anything. Right. Like this, so right? the official uniforms of cadets actually look very similar to the Starfleet uniforms, except you don't get the pips. Okay. So the episode you're talking about is um, where they're in San Francisco. The Red Squad. Uh, yeah. What's, with Tom Paris, the actor, except mm-hmm. not playing Tom Paris. Yeah. Uh, that was supposed to be the Sam character. Sam Licardo? What is the name? Eh, it's not that, that was supposed to be the, 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 the same character going into Voyager, uh, but they just changed up the name. Hmm. Just just something that popped up on Reddit. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I'll go along with that. It's good. Do you good. not browse like Daystrom Institute from time to time? No. What? The what? That's like the best subreddit. Daystrom Institute? Do you know what the Daystrom Institute is? No. It is one of the premier <sighs> physics and space science research institutes uh-huh. in the 23rd century. <laughs> uh, Daystrom, uh-huh. who was uh, the name of a character in the original series, oh. he was the one who created, I believe, the holodeck. He's one of the, 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 the most famous scientists. Like, he created the AI that would eventually lead to things like the holodeck. Okay. Richard Daystrom. You can read about this memory alpha. You oh, know what yeah. memory no. alpha is. Oh, I, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I call him Dick Daystrom. <laughs> <laughs> is that like Wikipedia for Star Trek? Yes. All right. R- R- memory alpha is the wiki for Star Trek. Got for it. Every episode, every character. Uh, but Richard Daystrom was an original series, and he created the uh, the inventor of the uh, computronic and duotronic computer, as I'm reading on memory alpha, which Star Trek fans have theorized is because it was about AI. It was basically about the singularity, right? Putting your brain mm-hmm. inside a computer. And compu- uh, Star Trek fans, the canon, the head canon that Star Trek fans have created, that is also uh, the technology that allows for AI in the holodeck. 
artificial characters in the holodeck for things like Moriarty. Yeah, but what are you browsing every week? So, Daystrom Institute, which is a fictional place in the Star Trek universe, is like that's their um, their space Princeton or space MIT, <laughs> space M- MIT. Okay, right? It's Daystrom Institute. On Reddit, there is a subreddit called the Daystrom Institute, oh. in which serious Star Trek fans, right? Like there's any other kind, right? Post thoughts and ideas about their theories and create the fan canon of the show and have honestly amazing discussions Uh about things from starship design. Like one of the things that popped up recently, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Why is DS9, why are the pylons concave inward as opposed to convex outward for for ship docking? Yeah. For sure. I've always wondered that. Uh, It's a legitimate question. Legitimate question. And it's because, as has been theorized by posters on the Daystrom Institute. Let's say the warp field bubble. Has War, yeah, yet. shield bubble. Shield bubble. Easier <laughs> one of them. There you go. Nice to and also the arc for defenses, because it was a military <laughs> base. For defenses, you want to put, uh, you get the most widest range for the, for the phaser and photon torpedo launchers if your pylons are posted inwards. Plus, if you have the ships on the outside, the ships become vulnerable. And since all the ships have our warp core base, antimatter matter reaction base, they essentially become bombs that become targets. So you want to protect them within the pylons between the defense. So that will give you that's some offenses. very Cardassian thing. So the kids from, from Galaxy Quest browse this. They, they, yes, they probably are moderators on this. What fifty six thousand members? It is an amazing subreddit. Wow. All right. I just gonna put it out there. All right. There yeah. you go. All right. That was like two years of warp field theory that took me to come up with that answer. <laughs> and uh, that's about it. Oh, last thing in pop culture. Uh, I, w- I will give once again a recommendation, Jeremy, to watch Black Mirror. <laughs> okay. This is your homework. Yep. Season five is out. I finally watched all season five. I'm going to give my quick review. I do agree with a lot of what a lot of people have said online that it's the weakest of the seasons, that uh, I think it's lost a, what it's trying to say about technology or it's kind of saying the same thing over and over again. I do think that Striking Vipers, the episode with Anthony Mackie, um, and forget the actor who plays Black Manta, he's also in it. I think that's probably the strongest episode. And while people have said that's an episode about VR, I don't think it's an episode about VR. It's an episode about um, video game culture and friendships and connections. So watch it with your family. Watch it with my family? They told me I could not play VR anymore. (laughs) And that does it for pop culture. Uh, before we move on to our next segment, I want to let you know that support for This Is Only a Test this week comes from Indeed. If you're looking for your next tech gig, it's time to flip the job search script with Indeed Prime. On Indeed Prime, top tech companies apply to you with jobs you'll love. Stop living for the weekend and start doing what you love with Indeed Prime. All you have to do is fill out one free application, and Indeed Prime takes care of the rest, putting tech talent in front of thousands of companies like PayPal, Twilo, WP Engine, across more than 90 cities. And it's that simple. They'll match you with the right role based on your skills, experience, and goals, and they won't spend any more time sending, and you won't spend any more time sending resumes after resumes to those companies. Companies apply to you, not the other way around. Plus, every Prime candidate gets free one-to-one live action access to a technical career coaching, resume reviews, mock interviews, and even salary negotiation tips to seal the deal. So whether you're hiring or looking, meet your match on Indeed Prime. Join now at indeedprime.com slash test. Again, that's indeed, P-R-I-M-E dot com slash test. It's kind of a programming montage sound that whole sound a uh, soundtrack is for this segment. That's I've, like what you would imagine yeah. in some type of uh, TV show about like you get close ups of fingertips type, yeah. typing on the keyboard, like, like, stressful thinking, wiping off sweat off the brow, yeah, and a nice aha moment, and then like spinning around the the chair and going, "I got it, I've solved it." He gets me hacked. I disagree completely. <laughs> It sounds to me like the theme to Doogie Howser, MD. Oh, yeah. All Which right. opened with not a computer. Bit, not too far. Right? Typing on a computer, no. right? Mm-hmm. Wasn't that what the, the opening sequence was? Yeah. It's true. There you go. Uh, we're going to kick off technology news this week with 
crypto. So, Jeremy. Oh, God. Time for you to explain. No, no, no. No. The Look, it's on here because it's a big piece of news. The thing is, none of us are qualified to talk about it, but we need to mention that it's happened. Facebook has introduced their own cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency, you know, like Bitcoin. Except this one's called Libra, and it's supposed to be more like, I don't know, less volatile and con- <laughs> and connect it. What? <laughs> Th- that's what I'm told. Gunther Kirch, our uh, producer, is a, an expert on these things. Even he couldn't explain this to me. But it, it's supposed to be, you know, a little bit like Ripple, if you follow that one. And it's, um, you know, it's. I have questions. I want to know, like, why would I use this currency? Why is Facebook doing this? So low volatility, probably the best interest to them. Yeah, right. I suppose for, so. for using a currency. And it sounds yeah. like, you know, the report's saying this will be used as payment systems for WhatsApp and Messenger. Like and a whatever. worldwide currency. That e- you exactly. So true, you yeah. lose all that going between banks and exchange rates and all the skimming off the top, that all the fees, essentially, yeah. uh, if they own the currency and they can they control the transactions. But every exchange like charges you something. So if you're going to trade, if you're going to cr- um, convert this back into whatever your local currency is, it's still going to cost you something. I'm curious, like... If anybody out there thinks this is a great thing, I'm curious. Let us know in the comments. Maybe it only goes one way. Uh, what? <laughs> Maybe you can only put yeah, money in. Right. That's what they you can't take money out. I imagine that would be good for them. Oh, it's very Hotel California then. <laughs> I there. I, and I don't mean this in any sort of cynical way. I, I legitimately don't understand this. And here's a comment from an Ars Technica writer uh, in the like article announcing this. Libra is a permissioned blockchain where there's a fixed number of nodes that are all known to each other. Sybil attacks aren't a concern, so there's no need for proof of work security mechanism. So my guess is that energy consumption won't be a significant concern. I do not understand anything in that entire yeah. like paragraph, basically. Um, I would lo- actually love to understand more about this. Energy so if there cons- are some good explainers I do out know there. that energy consumption is I understand, yeah. a big complaint about Bitcoin because it costs so much money to run the computers to calculate but it doesn't map- mine. Yeah, but it doesn't map like why a fixed number of nodes would actually... Right. I, don't could, yeah, I don't understand this at all. Okay. Hmm. That's that. All right. Well, Let well it, explain it, it to us. It only works if it's going to be seamless and for the end users not to worry about any of this stuff, not to worry about volatility, transactions. Yeah. If they can put in money and get more value out of it and have and make it simple, low friction transactions is, I guess, the goal. It's not some type of investment scheme that they're building up, presumably. Yeah. Uh, did you hear about what Google's doing locally? So this is interesting. So it, more relevant to the Bay Area, but of course, Bay Area, we have a housing crisis. And, I have a lot to say about this. And one. a lot of like a lot of uh, a lot of big tech cities, right? With all the growth, you know, they're displacing people, and basically more people are coming in with high income than uh, than the housing market can support. And it bas- it is a, like a, a thing that the local governments are reckoning with, right? It's a big, big controversial topic. Uh, Google announced this week that they are devoting what they say is a billion dollars to help mitigate housing needs in the housing crisis in oh, more in close to where they are in Mountain well, View, uh, not necessarily San Francisco. But let's look at the fine. Yeah, let's this. break it down. Because split between this billion dollars is really 50 million in cash, right? It's Which a, is dedicated towards alleviating like um, uh, uh, keeping people in their homes. Yes. Essentially, yeah. it is like a a stay subsidy, in your housing subsidy subsidy for right. So, uh, which is that's not an insignificant portion of it, but we're talking about that's 5%. Uh, 750 million, 75% of this is for uh, what they, it's it's value of land they own that will then get turned into development that they're going to use to develop or lease out for housing to be built over 10 years. So this is the big issue. So they have property that is zoned commercially that is valued currently at about $750 million. There's a really good uh, Vox explained podcast about what I'm about to talk about, which is that zoning in California is mostly done as single family home zoning so that multiple units can't be built on that land. Commercial zoning is slightly different. What Google is saying is we're gonna give over this land for homes to be built, but it has to be municipally approved to be rezoned 
to housing and not only not uh, not to single family housing which is what homeowners want it to be zoned to so that their property values stay the same but to multi-unit uh housing so that construction can happen on it that step has been a step that's being explored in california for decades and the fight over zoning regulations is incredibly complicated is fraught politically because homeowners have been rallying against this for a number of years uh, but they point to some really good data that's important so last year in the south bay where google's talking about doing all this this land transfer there are only three thousand homes built three thousand homes built yeah. for a market where unemployment is below two percent uh that they're suggesting that if this turns over they could build fifteen thousand homes there's so many problems with those ifs that um I think there should be a skeptical eye delivered to this. There was a great discussion on KQED Forum this morning about the complexities of this. It's really unfortunate. It's basically if homeowners said, yes, we want to see multi-unit housing built, and we started just building housing, a lot of things could be solved. But all the the prognostications at this point is that this will go nowhere. Well, you did a much better job with that than I did with the Facebook crypto. Oh, just wait till my Eternals explain. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other $250 million is incentives for other developers. But again, these are they're categorizing these as investments. So it's not pure. That one's actually more interesting to me because if you're a, a, a developer and you're looking at like a 10% return on like a luxury condo building, mm-hmm. and by having this fund, they take a low income or affordable housing unit whose margin is only 5%, but mitigate the risk by investing the capital in, well then like that can move that can move things from a finance standpoint. But wow, this is like really weird for our podcast to be talking about stuff like this in depth, but I mean, it's uh, getting the headlines, right? Like like the you know, the, it's working from their PR perspective that they're announcing well, a, a billion, billion dollars. A billion dollar and Wells Fargo came out today and also said they're dedicating a billion dollars and very similarly structured. But that, you know, the skeptical eye, you know, the fine print should be read. It's a people problem it is a single family homeowner problem it is not a corporate part problem mm. uh this just came out today Wirecutter has a uh advisory for people uh, if you have bought a nest cam a used nest cam like on ebay craigslist or something this is nest owned by uh amazon i can't think about who owns who no, Nest owned by Google. Sorry, yeah. Ring is owned by Amazon. God, all these companies are being bought up. Back to back to Google. Uh, if you bought a, a used Nest Cam, uh, there's a risk that your camera can be accessed by the previous owner still if they tied it to like their account. Even if you like sign out or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, huh. Yuck. Okay. So so how do you fix that? I don't think there is a solution. <laughs> If it's linked to a, a they say a, a Wink Hub two, it's still piping to there. They okay. need to fix it on their end. So buy a new Nest. Yes, yeah. so, or or unpl- if you bought a used one, unplug it for now until they make the announcement that they've solved it on Dang, on the server end. Yeah, uh, for a uh, factory set it. Okay, and and that might help. Okay, as well. I so. just have the thermostat. That's all I have. Well, that's, somebody that's, else is going to be. That's con- how they started. Did you buy it used on eBay because somebody else is going to control the the temperature? Yeah, right. Yeah. I've been wondering why it's hitting yeah. eighty recently. <laughs> Makes no less sense in in Bay Area where not we don't have AC the thermostat but yet yet yeah yeah last week did, did make a case for it uh, some new stuff with CarPlay dude <clears throat> you guys don't use CarPlay otherwise I think there'd be more excitement on this panel about this so iOS 13 was revealed at WWDC and uh, since then the betas have been released to developers and Nine to Five Mac did a rundown of the most recent beta one and two of CarPlay and it's got some cool stuff in it that I am personally excited for because I live on CarPlay when I'm in my car, in my car. Number one, it's going to show multiple things at once. So you're going to have your map on the screen as well as music controls. And there's nothing I do more than switch between those two things all the time like in, in the, the menu. So that's great. It's also, I don't know, it's going to have a calendar functionality which I don't totally understand. Mm-hmm. But I guess it potentially if you, if you, you know, if you need to call somebody at a certain time, it would show that in that window. This isn't replacing the iMessage. And you would initiate, no, it's yeah. still there. But you can like initiate a, a, you know, a call that way. Uh, you can get directions someplace if it's on your calendar. Like it just, it's, it surfaces the things that are relevant right now. Um, but maybe like best, most important to me is 
the worst thing about CarPlay is if, especially if you're in a car with your family and somebody wants to use the phone and it's in use in CarPlay, the, the phone has to be on whatever screen is on CarPlay. And so if they hit the home button, your CarPlay m- maps go away. It's yeah. mirrored? Yes. Well, it's essentially mirrored. It's not the same thing, but it's the same app. And if somebody opens up messages, it'll open up messages on CarPlay and that kind of thing. And if you say, no, I need the map, and you hit it on CarPlay, it'll force their screen to go to the map. Well, theoretically, you don't want people use, you don't want someone using their phone. You just want them, the interface to be the CarPlay voice interface. Uh, I don't know if that's the theory. I mean, the, the, they probably didn't figure a way to multitask that properly. Mm. Well, they have in iOS 13. So okay. now it's completely independent. So it's a background event using the processing yes. power of the phone, and so you can be The person on in the Reddit. passenger seat can be doing whatever they want on your right. phone. I assume the music will be the same, right. but they can use a different app, and CarPlay stays the same. I wish that was the case for more than just CarPlay, because if you're using AirPlay, you know, if, if, if someone has their iPad or their phone and piping a movie from iTunes. Like to a TV or something? You want to, you know, sometimes you don't want that device to be incapacitated. Yeah. Well, this now shows that they can do it. I mean, this is when we talk about diminishing returns for the products. It's an unnecessary feature, but they have way, we're finding out there's a lot more processing power in these devices than is really needed for a lot of the, just the day-to-day stuff. And this is maybe where some of that stuff can, that, that processing power can be put to use. Here, here. Um, Going to more car stuff. Now, this goes, and we're not going to jump into a Elon shower this, this week, but some Tesla news, Tesla cars news. Uh, last week at E3, the weirdest presentation uh, was a fireside chat with Jeff Keeley. I always confuse Jeff Johns. Jeff Keeley. Yeah. Um, who runs like the, the big show the they video have game down awards. there in the Video Game Awards, but had Todd Howard and Elon Musk together on stage. Why was Elon Musk at E3? I don't know. Cause, because it, it's a crowd, it drew a crowd. Video games? Yeah, okay. I, I guess. And, and then, he, well, they announced that Fallout Shelter uh-huh. is coming into Tesla cars. The mobile game? The mobile game. Okay. The kind of like you know, uh, base building. Yeah, free to play. Free to play mobile game is coming up, it's coming to the cars. <laughs> Your car? Sure. I mean, I thought Cuphead was a interesting enough announcement yep. uh, but you know you plug in the, there's now support for PS4 Xbox controllers and oh, wow. uh, addition to the t- touch screen yep. uh, and there's a uh, beach buggy racing what is something that's coming out there's a new racing game you, have you seen the video for this they did a whole commercial of like a race car driver getting into yeah, uh, Elon's Tesla been tweeting it out yeah. and and doing a full racing game in, in a parking lot is this a new game is a, I think I think it's a new game and like all the cars in it like the car that well, you're driving in it too <laughs> is a tesla yeah uh, so right. ridiculous i think it's a mobile it's a mobile i game. feel like this is mission creep in the worst way possible yeah it's it's super weird as a as a to, to put engineering resources but they work with developers vector units so it was a mobile game um ios and android and, and tablet game uh beach buggy, buggy racing 2 Oh, wow. you use your steering wheel to steer? You use your steering wheel to steer. Can you do that with pole position currently? Yeah, uh, I think you can. Yeah. I mean, I well, guess they're, they're trying that. to make the car an entertainment experience while you're charging. That, I think, is the, the thinking. Because web browsing, Netflix, is you know, stuff that's eventually going to come that I know they're proud of the battery capacity and this stuff in the grand scheme of you know power required to drive push cars down f- freeways at 65 miles per hour is inconsequential people aren't gonna be sitting in their garages or really in parking lots you know or drive-ins playing these games the place to do it is a supercharger, a supercharger or a not so supercharger right any any other type of of charger and people have their phones anyway which is what most people are on but i guess here's a way to it, who's gonna be spending because like fallout felt shelter is not a pick up and play you know, th- no, three it's minute a thing. Time investment. It's 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 a it's a th- it could be a time suck. So this is rolling out now. Do you have it? I don't have it yet. And in addition, they're also using this as a showroom um, uh, attraction, because between now and the end of the month, they're going to have demo units at their showrooms, which they I guess they, I guess they still have a few of those What's around. It? What do you mean a demo unit? They're calling it Tesla Arcade, where people can go to Tesla centers uh-huh. and play games. Oh, RSVP at a store <laughs> near you. The most fun thing you could possibly buy. I guess that's that's their mission. 
Yeah. It, and I assume it's going to be free because there's no point in selling no. these games. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Huh. It goes to show like there's a lot of processing capability on the on their dashboard. Yeah. And maybe because they're working with third party firms, the third parties are more interested in in making these work for the cars to you know increase appeal for people who have the cars and maybe we'll download them on their tablets. Does it use force feedback on the steering wheel? I don't know. That'd be that'd be cool. I don't know. I just don't I, I have no interest if I if unless I'm like even at a, at, a, at a charger, right? You go to you go to one of these superchargers, everyone's just on their phone checking email, surfing. Happy to do that. I'm, I'm pl- still plugged in. Dude, what if though? What if Don't say multiplayer. You could do an eight, don't say multiplayer. eight car multiplayer. Um, <laughs> that like everyone's synced up at the supercharger. Only at the supercharger. Yeah. And you got to send challenges to people like it, you, ooh, this super it, Superchargers. I'm gonna skip this one. Only one car. I'm gonna go to the one 30 miles down the road. All your because audio would be synced seven up. Seven cars there. I love this idea. And then like whoever wins, you could get, get like the lights could flash and the horn could honk, God. and like everyone else would know. That'd be great. You could have a high score list that was persistent, and everyone gets out of their cars and high fives each other. Yeah, shake hands. it brings you together. It gets you off your phone and like it makes you friends with everybody. My experience has been one of two kinds. One at the at the uh, supercharger, at the superchargers. One where, uh, like the Kettleman City one, uh, people are friendly, and especially in the early days, like last year when there weren't as many Model Threes on the road, people are curious about the car. Yeah, look around. A lot of people are seeing what type of mods they've done. You know, car wraps and and rims and stuff, and like have a friendly chat. Like, oh, that's a cool thing you did for your car, uh-huh. right? Uh, or the other experience is no one talks to anyone. Everyone's head buried. In phone exactly I don't know what type of community they, they want to build you could do I mean even without multiplayer you could do a pretty great sound in, in that car because it's you yeah, know, yeah. Full I, mean, I, I, sound. I watched the, the trailer for uh, uh, rise of Skywalker at a supercharger that's right and piped the sound and through Bluetooth and it sounded really good I don't know I think this multiplayer thing might have legs like remember version tried to do that on the airplane where yeah. they have, you could play against people in different seats, but that experience, right. the experience of actually getting into a game was unpleasant. But well, was, uh, they were using the old uh, interfaces, which are super slow, yeah. very laggy. Yeah. I mean, back then, Virgin wanted people to send drinks to each other, say hi, ping each other. Yeah. It was a, a Tinder on a plane. It Did, didn't work out so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to poke Norm in seat 12A? Mm, uh, no, no, no. I just want to take a nap. Uh, Google Pixel 4. All right. Pixel 4, did, wasn't Google I.O. just like last month? This is what's weird. So Pixel 4, uh, the rumors are, and it's been pretty much confirmed by Verizon, will be out in October. Uh, there were, like, can you call it leaks when Google itself puts out images of the phone well, from it its own Twitter? Well, it was in response account? to real leaks yeah. that went out, and then a tongue-in-cheek, well, you want pictures? Here they are. Yeah, and you see the rear of the phone, which has in its upper left at least a three-camera system, if not four. So this is this is the design theme, I think, for this year, right? The camera module becoming less of – it used to be just a circle. Like if you look at like the iPhone XR, it is just the, – the bulge is just a circle for the lens. The lens element needs to be out there mm-hmm. uh, to uh, – on many phones now, a two-camera system. So, for example, I'm going to go back to the iPhone ecosystem. You have two cameras, and it's an uh, oval bulge, right? It's mm-hmm. not exactly an oval. It's like a long, like I don't know what that shape is called, but like a, you know, it's, it's connected, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, to the theory is that on it looks like confirmed on the Pixel 4, but the theory also is whenever the iPhone is going to come out this year, it will be more of a, a larger square. A, a rounded bulge. square, yeah. A rounded square as, as a bulge. Because there's um, more lenses. Because yeah. it's hiding behind it lens elements as well as the light, as well as depth sensor maybe. Uh, but think of that as like the, the imaging unit of the phone, and that becomes more and more accepted as, as the back of the phone. Mm-hmm. Ex- yeah. I, yeah, okay. and there are also leaks of it out in the wild, so the images Google – Put out have been pretty much confirmed by some of the the images we see. This is a um, real non-story. What? Is, is, <laughs> there's nothing here. Oh, I put in the wrong link. That's why you can see the actual image if you go to a oh. different thing. In there. Okay. I, I think. I think the design of that phone is actually like as Norm said is pretty indicative of the phones we're going to see this fall. Yes. I and, and maybe not even f- like 
this year, but like going forward, the the back of the phone, just more of that real estate being devoted to some type of world facing sensor, uh, as Apple wants to do war- more world mapping, build up on its SLAM technology, as we expect them to go into AR pretty heavily, uh, that just makes more and more sense. I'll make phone cases, you know, relevant again, and people have to buy whole new phone cases to to have the right you know holes for these these notches. But we're never going to go back to the day of the, the flat, the, the flush back of the f- on the back of the phone. You know, the good old days, right? You know, iPhone 4, iPhone 5, where the phone could sit flat on a table and be flush? No. Yep, that's no. gone. Yeah, yeah. Unless it's in a case. Yeah. Uh, any either of you use Kindles? Uh, I do. I still use a Kindle Paperwhite. Oh. Do you use it right before bed? Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. Your eyes must be hurting. Well, it depends on the light you have in the room. You don't have the backlit one, right? Does the, the paper, does the paper white have the backlight? It does have backlight. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oasis is their high-end one. $250. I can't believe it's still a thing. But there's a new Kindle Oasis that does color temperature adjustment um, at night. Cool. Yeah. There you go. 250 bucks for Fil- 8 gigs. Filters out the blue light. Still, I'm, I'm not convinced. a believer in this blue light thing. Oh, you're a scientist. My no. do- my doctor just like this week told me I needed to I keep to hearing use it. it everywhere. Yep. I don't know. You about try it because I do it. I put it on the night mode right before bed, just in case. Just in case any yeah. blue hits you. Yeah, and then you know I feel like I sleep. I sleep all right. I don't know. Mm. Is it bad? I don't know. I'm skeptical that it really has any of these impacts that are oh. being said, because it's not like you're staring at that blue light consistently. You're like putting up and pulling up and down your phone. I'm just not. Mm. Uh, I gotta look into some studies about this. Yeah, be careful because you might be look wrong. Out. In a month from now, when I'm back again, yeah, I'll have information exactly. on this. And I think that does it for technology news this week. Let's move on. This week's episode of This Is Only a Test is made possible with support from Pedal. Debt is a massive problem, and the truth is, traditional credit card companies don't do much to help. But now there's a new kind of credit card company called Pedal. Pedal was started by a group of people who were sick of old school credit card companies. That's why their Visa credit card has no fees, and their mobile app is designed to help you manage spending responsibly. Pedal's cashback program rewards you for doing the right thing. Earn 1% cashback right away and up to 1.5% cashback when you make 12 on-time payments. Pedal is a great modern option for anyone, but especially those who are just starting to build credit because you can even qualify even if you've never had credit in the past. Pedal partners with web bank member FDIC. As of today, the Pedal Visa's variable APRs range from 15.24% to 26.24%. It's about time a credit card company helped you succeed financially. Check out the Pedal Credit Card. It's responsible credit for the modern world. Go to pedalcard.com slash test today to find out more. Once again, that's pedal with a T. Pedal, P-E-T-A-L, card.com slash test. Moment of silence. Oh, welcome return. Yeah, it's been a long time. People I'm glad my, for it. my intro was uh, about as consistent as it always was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Princess Bride is one of the possible books that my son can choose for summer reading. Oh, so I'll give you a choice right now. Do you want to hear the Princess Bride story or do you want me to get on my soapbox? Oh, that's that's, that's Princess soap. Bride story. Okay. Princess Bride story. Okay. Go always box. choose your pr- Princess Bride. Oh, how about both? Why not both? We will do, we'll get to both for sure. All right. Do you know what polydactylism is? It is the no. condition where you have an extra digit on oh, your hand. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. And uh, for the longest time, uh, oh, polydactylism has actually been pretty well studied. There are even references to people with extra digits going back about 100 years in scientific literature. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the most part, uh, polydactylism is, is indicated that that finger isn't incredibly useful. Well... As we've gotten better understanding of polydactylism and now we've able to apply genetics to it, we've seen some like shifts in our understanding. Um, In a paper that came out in uh, early June of this year, uh, there was a study of two uh, 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 children with six fingers and they were superhuman with this 
six finger x-men uh they're able to do incredible things that we see as mundane they're able to tie their shoe with one hand and not like oh they could tie their shoe with one hand they could just tie their shoe as we would with two hands normally with six fingers which doesn't make sense because most of our understanding of polydactylism is that uh the the finger is sort of attached and it won't have freedom of motion this actually had an extra degree of freedom and when they looked at some of the anatomical scans and then MRI scans of the brain mm -hmm. found independent musculature skeleton uh, skeleton structure and then independently developed areas of the brain that are controlling that digit so it was able to be controlled um uh independent as opposed to some other polydactyl cases where when you would control that extra digit, it would like cause another digit to contract. It's tied to like people sometimes. I mean, the plasticity of the brain, like you get locked in pretty early in your life where a lot of people can't move a pinky finger without ha moving, you know, their the ring finger because it's not their thumb. You're not using it all the time. You're not Tarzan. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is also as much a, a Gattaca story as it is a Princess Bride story. Do you remember in Gattaca, uh, Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman go to a, a concert a pianist and the mm. pianist has 12 fingers mm. and he's seen as like inferior because he's not genetically perfect but he's the only one who could play this music that was specifically arranged for 12 fingers so this reading the study made me mad at my fork the other night i'm like stupid five finger hand like i have to control this fork in this dumb way imagine we talk about the word uh, we use the word doff a lot on this podcast degree of freedom yeah think about if we could apply that to our hands if we had an extra degree of freedom on our hands people is this an inheritable trait uh no they most can't, likely not they it's can't like a mutation that we don't see passed down yet okay so right. are you look are you, you can't looking? crisper it are you no like, yeah i was wondering like is this is this the kind of mutation? like tinder profiles that are like Six digits only. Is this evolution happening right in front of our eyes? It is definitely a mutation that uh, like, could potentially. There is no selection pressure that's going to make this sort of propagate down in a way. But uh, I think it's just sort of fascinating. Like We think about ourselves as, as being sort of a, a highly evolved sort of specimen. I just like this story. And also, I think the neuroplasticity part is super weird. Um, soapbox! Soapbox or Bodie oh. McBoat face? <laughs> I don't know. Whatever you want, so man. Box. It's so your box. segment. So All right. Box. Uh, so what I really care about, like I, I talk about science on the show a bunch. I talk about science elsewhere. Yeah. The thing that really matters to me, and it has been this way for more than a decade, is not about like being out there as a science communicator. There's always been uh, better people than me uh, doing that work. There always will be. Uh, but what has mattered to me is like how that science communication actually fits in the greater context of society. Uh, today, uh, the Wellcome uh, Institute, which is a foundation based in the UK, uh, released a report where they collaborated with Gallup, where they surveyed 140,000 people across 140 countries about how they feel and perceive science in their own towns. And one of the key indicators they're looking at is trust in science and trust in scientists, which is an indicator I've sort of like dedicated my life towards. Um, because I see like the real positive outputs of, of science impacting society. Uh, and when you delve into this report, which I think is a good read for any nerd, you see some like really meaningful outputs here is when trust in science is high, we see people that are more likely to follow uh, certain types of health advice. Their, their uh, quality of life tends to go up. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion about people that don't trust science, like whether it's people that aren't uh, vaccinating, uh, whether there's like an anti-science, quote unquote, agenda out there. And this report across 140 countries really shown a light on what that actually looks like. There isn't really this group that is anti-science, or if there is, there are very few. Most of the people that actually have diminished trust in science uh, have a high degree of economic in insecurity in their life or they have a, a, a high degree of distrust for government for very good reasons. Uh, we see that in Brazil. We see it in uh, Iran. We see it in Korea. We see it in like all these regions mm -hmm. that they looked at pretty consistently. And uh, most of like science communication tends to speak to people that are already kind of interested in science for the most part. Like I kind of imagine that most of the people that are listening to this podcast probably are kind of into science already. That's cool. 
uh, I love it. But it it tells us like if we really want to make a difference for people, like especially uh, people that are making health choices in their lives that are going to affect like real meaningful outcomes for them, we really got to talk to people that are economically un- insecure. Um, and like more science uh, communication, more science engagement, uh, where we listen to those people, uh, has to be incorporated in it uh, in a more strategic way. Uh, this report like really shaped, shaped uh, like shifted my opinion on like who really needs this uh, at this point. Who really needs access to scientific information, and who really needs to have that done on their terms. The uh, last thing I'll highlight is they looked at gender disparity um, in science. And one of the things that they found is that uh, men tend to have a lot more confidence in science knowledge than women, uh, with, when you, even when you control for like the same degree of education. And this is across the board, every country, every region. And what that tends to result in is uh, men uh, tend to explore science and like find more scientific information like to a much higher degree than women counterparts in every single country they surveyed. That's not just like a, that's not a, a, a developing nation issue. It's not like every single country. And that gap was somewhere between like six and 10 points. That is like a massive gender disparity that is across the board about, um, ab- ab- about women just being, not being either encouraged, like there could be a million different, like not being encouraged to, to pursue scientific knowledge uh, systemic issues that are not allowing to encourage this is like massive quality of life issues and it also limits the progress of scientific research um, by limiting the sort of like human and mo- mental capital that's coming into the field this is like sort of like the challenge of our time like when i saw that data this morning i was up at five in the morning like seeing the unveil of this report I, like i i almost like kind of started crying because like this is it this is the data is in front of us of people from all walks of life uh, and they're showing us and they're showing us how the systemic issues about how uh, their economic situation, uh, their cultural situation are limiting their ab- ability to really uh, benefit from the value that science brings to them. That is not a delightful soapbox, but it's a soapbox that will that. If uh, it makes, uh, okay. makes you feel any better, my daughter has always loved Doc McStuffins. <laughs> and, what? And she just did a report on Mae Jemison. Mae Jemison actually was at this panel this morning that okay. unveiled this report. Wow, she's been on Star Trek. Yes, she That's has right. been. <laughs> actually, my, back. my friend, uh, welcome, like when he tweeted a picture of Mae Jemison, like quoting Maya Angelou about the need to, to listen to people, she, he like wrote in parentheses, like she was also on Star Trek. <laughs> So, and I love nerds on, abound. on Savage Bills. I hope this is a continuing motif. I love that there are women in the workshop. Yeah, it, I I think representation is a is a start, but I think it, it, like it go the data tells me there's something more that yeah. we have to do. It's not, but to the extent that it's yeah. that is systemic to what's in societal, I mm-hmm. think just getting those examples out there is a great step. If I have any like a legacy that I can leave on this planet, is like I want to see those numbers shift in my lifetime. I want to see them shift in a big way. Because if they do, that means like the progress we'll have made in in science is going to be untold. Um, all right, happier things. Uh, even though I find that just totally energizing, Bodie McBoatface. We made fun of this name, even though the UK Research Council, who said like they weren't actually going to give the boat this name, yep. laughed it off. It was named for this boat that was going to go out and measure sort of surface sea uh, surface sea temperatures. Well, Bodie McBoatface even though it's not called that, came back what with the results of its study. It oh. was examining wind patterns and how those wind patterns are affecting <laughs> um, uh, global sea temperatures. Oh, it's terrible news. Oh, Bodie no. McBoatface found that bad it, news, a bearer of bad news. It found that the accelerate, there is an acceleration of uh, temperature change that, and there's uh, some curtain patterns that indicate that warming is accelerating. Woo! Bodie McBoatface! <laughs> Woo-hoo. Bodie McSad, Boat Sad Face. You know, we made fun of that it's name. Good. You know, the reason it's getting all these headlines, this study is getting headlines, is that it was Bodie McBoat Face. Yep. But it came back with this, like, super serious result. So Great. I'm all for these ridiculous names because it, it kind of cuts through the noise. This is, like, an important mm-hmm. finding, and now we're talking about it. The thing that cuts through the noise is internet humor. <laughs> Cats. That's the saddest thing. Levity. Yeah. Uh, 
Should we talk about this moon thing? You yeah. want to talk about it? Yes. Oh. What? You're saying that because you didn't pick it. No, no. I'm asking if you yeah. would like to talk oh, let's about do it. it. I don't know anything about it. I saw there was a science story, and I was going to research it in case you weren't coming on, and I didn't. But it looks like there's a big mass, there's a big something massive beneath the moon's surface that we didn't know was there. What was the movie where we kind of saw the animation of like of uh, the uh, moon kind of splitting off from the Earth via collision? There's like a okay. famous kind of movie and like early in the movie. Because that's see. the theory of how the moon got no, there. Not theory. We just that's know that's how it Sorry. worked. Right. So like everyone knows that. Uh, but yes. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> this is where his eyes start darting back and forth, by the way. Like this moment. Uh, but uh, there, like we know the moon's been hit with a ton of asteroids over time. Yeah. Uh, what they're showing is based off of uh, essentially like kind of a heat mapping. It's sort of a LIDAR under the surface kind of um, uh, detection. They found an object embedded under the crust of the moon, which means it was like an extraordinary impact uh, that must have happened. That left some sort of crater, but some of those have been covered up by other uh, impacts over time. Uh, but now there's this just under the surface, uh, like another object that's just embedded in the moon. Object like could like be, an asteroid could be a transformer. Oh, I mean, it could be. I'm not saying it's not. Right. Exactly. But it's not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's something that is uh, not of this Earth and not of that moon. No, it has to be like some sort of asteroid. And it's wow. enormous. Like, uh, what did they say it was? 4.8 quintillion pounds. Jeez. That's a number I don't understand. No. I don't Can't know how many it. zeros that is. Yeah. Let's see. It is. Hey, 2024, man. Six, uh, 12, 15. Let's get back up there and take a look. It's 17 zeros. All right. That's a lot. That's a lot of poundage. That's not even metric. So many zeros are there. Do they know what the what it's com- composed of? Some asteroid. <laughs> Rock. Okay. I don't know. I mean, like, they think the impact must have happened about 4 billion years ago. Okay. There's a lot we don't know about the moon yet. Hey, science is back. Yeah. Is that it for the yeah. moment of science? Oh. Good moment. Thank you, Kishore. Yeah. Let's do it again sometime. Let's do it again sometime. The VR Minute. Virtual reality this week. Oh boy! Speaking of people of certain socioeconomic okay. means, let's wait, what? what? People, <laughs> people who buy VR headsets. This is not exactly people who are, you know, struggling. I'm going to give him a more, C- more minus for that transition. Yeah, that was not very <laughs> good. I, I would call no, that a really a poor segue. Oh, yeah. I mean, it might have been negative and like, you know, not not real good. It didn't have a point. Didn't? I no. Know. I mean, I'm, you know, I like VR. It's all good. We all like VR. All right. Okay. <laughs> I, last, I, you know, Kishore, you I regret week. my soapbox. I also, <laughs> I, yeah, go ahead. Uh, last week, we talked about the, the controversy that was brewing uh, in the virtual reality community, specifically around Oculus Quest and the restrictions and kind of the guidelines that Facebook Oculus have created about uh, app developers. And, and especially there are some specific examples from uh, To the Top to uh, Pavlov VR to uh, Climby. Uh, Climby and Jet Island. Uh, Jet, Jet Island. And, and, and uh, who, was, was it um, uh, To the Top that was the most notable one? Um, oh, a uh, virtual desktop, of course, about, you know, yeah. whether they could publish on the the store or... No, know, no, no. The virtual desktop was about the feature that yeah, they included. Or the, virtual, the feature that they were asked to pull back yes. and, and, and what that meant. Uh, and, you know, we had our say about it. You can listen to it last week. But Oculus, you know, they actually came out and had Jason Rubin <laughs> address each of these circumstances and, and talk about... Uh, their perspective. I was impressed by the, not the fact that it wasn't, I mean, he could have come out and made a very generic, you know, give us time, we have a standard that we're trying to uphold, generic kind of overarching excuse, but he came out and he specifically addressed each of these games, and I thought that was great. I thought that was very transparent of him. Well, let's talk about the actual, uh, the actual responses and the circumstances around each game, and, and at the end, we can talk about whether this is reasonable mm-hmm. or we still think there's there's much to go like overarchingly you know the, the, he acknowledges that this is a this platform it's early they're learning 
And you know, I think this is talking specifically about virtual desktop. They said disruptive new features landing without notice. Don't give them time to contemplate safety, comfort, and platform ramifications. Notice platform ramifications. That's probably mean sales numbers and, and app, app sales. They don't review the updates, but they do ask that devs work with them on major changes, compatibility changes. Let them know. Yeah. Launch. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so specifically, let's ask for. So he's uh, saying that virtual desktop should not have included that feature without not running have. it by them. Exactly. Yeah. Because they do their approvals for the, the app releases. They could have avoided but all of not this. Not at the l updates, which sounds yeah. like a bandwidth problem, right? Like. You mean a personnel problem? Personnel problem. Yeah. You know, and if they're going to create these guidelines, like there's n literally nothing stopping for a developer from releasing something and then uh, that's approved and then updating it and making it completely different. So that's just fundamentally, this is like, if you're building a walled garden, that's that's you know kind of the business you're in, and but that's the reality you have. iOS has always had this issue where they get apps that are you know, perfectly legit, and then they embed an emulator, a Super Nintendo emulator, in one of the updates, and it goes out, and people discover it, and then it gets taken down. Yeah, yeah. So it's very similar uh, in that regard, but probably don't have as big an uh, app review team as, <laughs> as Apple. I I yeah. does, Apple does. So, okay, to the top. The, uh, Jason Rubin says he apolo they apologized for falling short with a few devs that they sent Quest dev units to before they had settled on their curation process. So this is the example where to the top, the dev got a dev kit, which means presumably it was approved to begin work on, and the assumption was that this would get, you know, go through the formal process uh, and got early hardware, but then the, the rules for what could and could not be in the store were determined after the fact, and they don't, they're not going to move back. They're not going to change the rules. It was just, sorry, you don't make it now. Yep. You, you, you didn't make it. We should let you know ahead of time before you put more work into it. That's a bummer. It still, it still doesn't change the fact that To The Top has been approved for all sorts of other platforms, including uh, PSVR, and it really it hasn't affected experience there, right? It, it hasn't taken down the, the comfort of PSVR. Uh, Virtual Desktop, they said uh, they asked them to roll back the update because of new features through user complaints. Hmm. So this is, this is tricky. We found out about the new features through user complaints, and it took us a while to get it to work. Yeah, and I can understand that because it does take a little bit longer to get everything working than it would if you had native hardware. But just getting... The, the theory here is that the problem with this update in terms of how it affected the platform, yeah. was that people were complaining to Oculus. Well, that's how they're, that they're framing, framing this. Framing yeah. it. People were complaining to Oculus about a feature that was not advertised, that was only kind of shared within a very hardcore yeah. VR com sub community. I think this is suspect. I, I, I'm, right? not, I'm not entirely convinced <laughs> that anybody complained to Oculus right? about this. Right, like I heard you could do Steam. I, I have Steam VR set up. Yeah. I heard you could do Steam. Yeah. I heard it down in, in some subreddit. Oh no, it's harder <laughs> to get set up than, than I realize. I'm no. complaining to Oculus. It's Oculus's fault. Oh, that, I don't think that's the case. That said, I, you know, I, I would imagine that the way it could have gone down is people internally tried it and found the experience to be less than optimal, which it is. It is. But it's also, it wasn't advertised. They, they right. went in knowing that this was an experiment. Well, they probably read about it on Reddit like everybody else. And then so they the, went in and tried it. And they realized that setting up Steam VR within Oculus, the, the Quest context, mm -hmm. is not really great. And your experience will depend on your wireless connection in your house, and hardware setup. It's and all never that going to be up to their standards of whatever the 8 milliseconds motions to photons is that, that the Quest is capable of. It's probably less than that. But th given the transmission over Wi-Fi, the encoding, decoding, it might be imperceptible to, to you even to your naked eye, but I don't think it's imperceptible to your lizard brain, and they're not going to be happy with that. So they're making a stance saying this was not a platform consideration. This was about comfort, safety, and quality of experience. That's that. And the, the fact that this ex un unpublicized experimental feature for s the people who did not have the proper setup for it or you know, the optimal setup for it, right. uh, Put it in the category of hurt, you know, hurt the consistency of experience on on Quest. Yes. Now, on the other hand, they have allowed um, is it the developer's name Guy or Guy? They, I think Guy. They've allowed him and everyone else to provide apps 
that you can sideload yes. that add this functionality, and they're not saying anything about that. Yeah. You do, yeah. And it's gotten so simple to do that with SideQuest that I'm kind of, I'm now on board with, with that solution. Because they could, they could try to do what Apple does and completely, completely block that, that out. Yes. And, and, and to their credit, absolutely. I think that is the right, th that's the right thing to do. Uh, I just think that as, as much credit as we're going to give them for addressing all these things, yeah. like these are still very carefully chosen words and they still dance around the topic where, where, it, where it all comes down to. Yeah. I, don't, I, I am also encouraged by the fact that Jason has said, I don't know if he says it in this twi tweet um, uh, thread, but he said that until they can figure out a way to do it that satisfies their requirements for user experience, they're not going to allow it to exist on the store. So that just tells me they are continuing to work on it, and I hope that they do have a system in place eventually that I told you last week I was not comfortable using. I, I got my you know motion sickness from playing Beat Saber uh, over using virtual desktop Steam VR, and if they if Oculus can find a way to play PC games stream to Quest, great. Yeah, yeah, and who knows if they're actually working on that. Uh, the, right. the, the other responses they have, uh, he has to like Jet Island and Pavlov, uh, I, I think are more reasonable. That was clarifying, for example, offer, them offering support for compatibility, yeah. never hearing back, so that's the other side of the story. And also for Pavlov, I think that is an amicable ending where the developer is moving forward yep. and getting support to put it on quests. And so that's good. And to be clear, the two that I mentioned last week, Climby and To The Top, those I saw those developers respond to the To The Top fiasco. They were in the threads talking about that issue and saying that if you weren't allow it in the store, I'm giving up. And I, just, I in those commentaries, I encourage them not to because I love those games and I want to see them on Quest. And I'm glad to see that Oculus is open to talking to them. Yeah, and as long as the, the rules are consistent and developers aren't putting a ton of work in and then being closed to, 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 to publishing yeah. for, um, for no good reason, you know, then, then it's okay. And again, the side loading thing uh, for experimental features, I, I completely agree. It's obviously not a market. It's not going to be making money for the devs who need to get paid for their time. I wonder. I wonder if those guys will add some sort of a way to pay for games on SideQuest. I think the moment that happens, then Oculus would shut it down. I wonder. Because then it is something that affects it's another store. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it's money that they left on the table. Everything on SideQuest, at least currently, by design, is things that, that you can't get on the Oculus store, that Oculus has said no thank you to. But maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe people would prefer to be on the SideQuest store if there was a better revenue share. I mean, I, I think I said it last week. I think some of this stuff is, could be market-driven, right? Like If people are buying these things in mass and there was a huge mar like market for it, which on the desktop side, that's, that's how something like... Uh, PUBG got its start, right? Yeah. Launching and kind of open uh, early access, people paying full price for it, building community. And then even though, you know, early early on full of bugs, it became the phenomenon that it was. And on the VR side, something like Onward, right? It, it, it isn't fully polished, but enough of the network effects uh, have made it a successful thing. Why not, right? It's Obviously the community, right? Like. It, and and the curation on the store, right? Like, what's surfaced, right? Like, for people, new right. users, for your mom and dad who are jumping in, it doesn't have to be front and center onward or whatever, you know, yeah. uh, what, what, experimental VR, less it's less comfortable VR. Because even even within the acceptable VR experiences, there's a range of comfort mm -hmm. and, a ra and a range of quality, to be honest. It's a, it, I'm having a hard time imagining a scenario where I'd rather be on SideQuest than the Oculus Store. But maybe maybe one day. I don't know. Um, okay, off of uh, off of Quest uh, into Rec Room and non VR news, I guess. Rec Room has an iOS beta. <laughs> Why not? They're on every other flat They're screen. On every other every other flat screen. Platform. Yeah, so you can sign up now. Uh, go to the Rec Room Twitter has a link, and you can go sign up to play Rec Room on your phone. You can get your your Quest fix without a without a headset. I wonder how do you play it with touchscreen? Everything? Does it use? It's it? going to be a swarm. Is it I just imagine like the lobbies are going to be full. I yeah. I wonder. I wonder what it plays like. You, I don't even. I haven't considered even trying it. I mean, do but, do you think that they should implement a way f so that when you jump in, you can say, "I want to be in a VR, like, not qu individual uh, side quest, but VR gym only." 
Well, you can join the specific activities in, right. as VR only. I know, I know, not the activity, not the quest, not the, the mini games, but like the main lobby. There is lobby. no, yeah, there's no main lobby. That's rough. But they're changing that. They're, they've talked about a new setup where they're going to have clubhouses mm. where you can set up your own clubhouse and have it be the way that you want, and then it would only be the type of people that you want to play with that are allowed in there. Oh, whoa, whoa, don't say type of people. <laughs> I think a VR chat does it, uh, it works around that with, by, with every instant having a unique identifier. So yeah. I can say I want to jump into right. gym, main hub number, this number. And all my friends can type that in. Because yeah, the biggest I, problem we have with Rec Room is trying to get into the main gym together because they fill up so quickly. Uh, that's not my biggest problem. Well, one, one of the problems we have getting started. Yeah. Or his eyes start darting back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> hey. The, but on the subject of my biggest problem, mm -hmm. there's, an, there's a new game from that game company coming out next month called, I think it's Sky. You know, the guys who made Journey and uh, Flower. Okay. And it's another game kind of like Journey. And... I guess there's a social component to it, and they've struggled with how do you get people to play together and not antagonize one another or not, you know, troll. troll. Yeah. And, uh, like, that's so much of what happens in Rec Room. And whether it's just kids being kids or whether it's racists or what have you, like, it's, it's not all the time, but it's frequent enough that it's become, like, that my experience of Rec Room is tainted with that. And I, I just want to go in and play with you guys in private rooms. And... They've the the guys who they, uh, that com that game company have an interesting solution um, where I guess there's some kind of it's a free to play so there's some kind of in-game currency and the only way that you you somehow get currency by interacting with other players but the other players are only allowed to chat with you if you've uh, sort of built up a reputation for formed a relationship with okay. a, using emojis to begin with hmm. and so. You can't run up and you can't, there's no VoIP. Like, you can't hear people right away. You can't, but it's not even the even voice. Chat at you. I mean, it's just the, right, the but physical banging into you and, and, and throwing their hands in your face. I and wonder doing how much gestures of that. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how much of that you can do without actually being friends. But I think that there's something there. I think that, like, the concept of having to forge a relationship before they become a full fledged communicator, there's something to that. that that's an interesting concept. I'd like to see. It thought through by other Well, I think companies. there are great examples in past MMOs and past multiplayer experiences where they can make a business of creating, you know, private servers. You know, if you want, if, if a company, if, if a group wants to create their clubhouse and pay for server time and let their community members, like if Tested wanted to do a, here's, you know, it, Tested fans and communities can, can, can jump in only with this password or because you're verified in a certain way. Uh, then that becomes an opportunity for them to create a side business out of that. Yeah, sure. Right. But that that I, I think they're still probably a, a little ways away from that. I think they there aren't enough users, overall users out there. They want to populate these rooms, and maybe that's why they're on these sixteen by nine platforms. I wonder. Hey, remember that Mario Kart VR that we saw in Japan? The video that went viral. Yep. Uh, it's coming to, to Irvine, to Southern California. Take me to it. I know. I know. Uh, it's going to be at an arcade. Uh, this is a licensed game, um, and it's going to be at the VR Zone Portal starting now. <laughs> yeah, it's at the right. K1 Speed Entertainment Center. Why aren't we Yeah, we're, why are we not in a car? I know. Let's go. Well, I'm serious. Let's if go. If anyone's in Southern California, go and send us pictures of the experience. Tell us how it was. Oh, this so, isn't South Bay. This is Southern California. Southern California. Yeah, exactly. So um, I think Band Bandai Namco uh, makes this version of it. Uh, people wear Vives. Um, you know, I think there are hand controllers as well. Uh, and apparently, it's a platform because you you're in this kind of go-kart simulator. Uh, but Mario Kart's just one of the games. There's also this game called Argyle Shift and Ski Rodeo. No, and thank so you. It's LBE that you can choose which, Mario Kart. which type of <laughs> seated racing game, VR racing game you want. But yeah, I think we all want. Okay. If somebody gets in there ahead of you and yeah. there's like a, a line for this and you watch them playing ski rodeo, yeah. your your head will explode. Maybe they already did Mario Kart, you know, maybe they're trying it all. Yeah. You remember <laughs> you can't fathom why you would play anything but Mario Kart. No, I can't. Do you remember that game I reviewed or I previewed rather on projections a couple weeks ago called Battle Wake? Yeah, you were at, you played at GDC. This is from Servios. I said there's no way this is coming to Quest. Because you said the graphics look so good. Guess what? It's coming to Quest. Whoa. Yeah. I okay. mean, I guess it's no surprise because they have two Quest titles already. Creed. And 
Electronauts. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, good for them. It's I, you know, I look forward to playing it on Quest now, probably because that's gonna be the l- least friction. And PSVR, it's coming too. It's yeah. a good-looking game. It's a pirate game, kind of a deathmatchy, uh, where you control a boat and uh, you can. It's really impressive graphics. Hey, uh, the VR Awards, twenty nineteen finalists. Oh yeah. Were uh, announced. Uh, this is gonna be. Uh, done. Let me see if I got the. Uh, Were you guys nominated for best VR coverage? No, no, we weren't. No, it was an honor to I even g- be considered. I give up. <laughs> <laughs> it's an annual uh, nonprofit event, um, and it's uh, through AIXR. The it's going to be November 11th, so end of this year, um, and uh, they've been running for the past couple of years. Uh, I think it's is this a UK based one? UK or. or um, uh, the AXR is uh, the Academy of International Extended Reality that runs <laughs> the annual oh, wow. uh, VR awards. Okay. They have a great logo. Uh, but the finalists for content mm-hmm. was announced. So I wanted to run them through oh. us. Yep. We're, n- we're not on the judges. There's quick. 80 expert judges, but we're not Go judging. quick, because I get a bail. I know. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, h- hardware of the year. Quest. Quick. Rift S, Vive Pro I, Reverb, Tesla Suit, or the XL5K HMD? Okay. Quest, next question. Okay. VR Game of the Year. I, I agree with you as well, <laughs> if I was to vote. Uh, VR Game of the Year. Uh, Astrobot, Hellblade, Shadow Point, Blood and Truth, Vacation Sim, Falcon Age, Transpose, Firewall Zero Hour, which is a PSVR uh, Counter-Strike game, Creed Rise to Glory, Free Diver, about that? Angry Birds, uh, Fishman's Tale, Angry Birds, <laughs> come on, <laughs> and, and, and Prose Enlightenment. I've, I've played all but one of these, all but one or two of these. Uh, if I had to give it to one right now, I'd say Astrobot. Yep, me too. That's my that was my gut as well. Although, I'm, yeah, I think between those, I, I give a special mention to um, to Blood and Truth. That's for I discussion. haven't played many of these VR experiences, so I'm not going to weigh in on that one. Okay, VR experiences, Vader Immortal. Uh, NBC has a one called 1111. Uh, Start VR is thing called Awake. We don't have to do all yeah. these. Yeah, all right. I, I, think, I, I think VR Immortal is probably a shoe in for that one. And then there's VR films and uh, VR companies of the year. VR marketing of the year. I know. How about that? Uh, educational stuff. It's, it's always great. I love this finals list because it shows us there's a lot of stuff yeah. out there right now. In VR, not just in games. There's stuff in healthcare, health, stuff in education. Look at all these LBE ones too. Yeah, and and it gives me a good list of things to start exploring for projections. But no, November 11th. All right. No VR journalism awards. Yeah. Yeah. Next year, guys. Next yeah. year. Yeah. Uh, and I think is that our last story? Do we have one more yeah. story? No, no, we gotta go. He's all gotta right. go. We gotta go. Uh, thank you so much, Kishore. Thank you, for, Kishore, for joining us this week. Really good to see you. Yeah, I'm glad I. I'm, I'm gonna. St- I want to get to a point where I can stop thanking you. Oh, because then you you would just be back on and not feel like a special guest. Yeah, I won't be here next <laughs> week. I like being thanked. <laughs> thanks for thanks for letting us know ahead of time. Uh, we got an outro this week, Jeremy. We do. From Jesse is from Earth. Wohawk. Hi there. I didn't see you. Passed it. Maybe, no, 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 just sweet quiche. Have you ever Parallel had dimensions? Have you ever had sweet quiche? I didn't know if that was a thing that it's really not good. Is it I a thing that is good? No, my my grandfather used to make a quiche, and he would just take whatever he found in the fridge. And one time he made it with berries and like fruit, and it was really, really gross, like super duper bad. All right, question answered. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, sweet. maybe somebody makes a good sweet we'll quiche. Go, Quince. We. Quince we, pie. We propose. Quiche with the parentheses, sweet. Yeah, yeah. We'll see if they go with that. So, it was probably Gary. Yeah, maybe. Whoa, Hawk, you made the list. <laughs> that was great.